It's my privilege to introduce Melanie Chukis Bradley. This is Melanie's first visit to North Dakota. And she immediately, on her arrival, wanted to go out and explore the North Unit of Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Melanie is a certified forest therapy guide. She has spoken about the benefits of forest bathing, slowing down, and connecting with nature with all of your senses. She was also awarded one of four inaugural Canopy Awards by Casey Trees for her efforts to educate people about the trees of Washington, D.C. Her favorite part of Rock Creek Park is the Boundary Bridge area, a plain, humble bridge, as she describes it. You walk over the footbridge, and you are in Washington, D.C. There is nothing that makes her feel happier. And she is here to share that passion with us today. Please help me welcome Melanie Chukis Bradley. Thank you so much, Pamela, for that lovely introduction. Is the mic working? Is it working too much? OK, great. So I am here. Um, Pamela talked about slowing down. And um, that's not something that Theodore Roosevelt did very often. <laughs> but it is something that I love to do when I go out into the woods. I love to just slow down and soak up the beauty of the forest with all my senses. Now, what I'm going to do today, first of all, I want to say, I want to thank Clay and Sharon and Pamela and Pam for all they're doing with the digital library and, and to say that it is the most user-friendly library you can imagine. As Pamela knows, I am completely tech challenged. I, I can't handle any kind of tech challenges. And the um, digital library, it's almost like instant gratification because when you're looking for something, you type it in, you're nodding clay, uh, you know, you type in the, the, into the little search window and everything you're looking for pops up immediately and it's so well organized and described. So I just want to give a real shout out to the digital library. What I'm going to do today, I'm going to talk about Theodore Roosevelt's explorations of Rock Creek Park. And then at the end of my talk, I will also talk a little bit about Theodore Roosevelt Island. Have any of you been to Theodore Roosevelt Island? Oh, good, quite a few of you. So I, my most recent book is about Rock Creek Park. It's called A Year in Rock Creek Park, and, and we do have that here for signing today. And the new book I'm working on is called A Year at Theodore Roosevelt Island. So I'm going to try not to be too tech-challenged here. Yay, <laughs> victory. Um, before talking about Rock Creek Park, I just kind of wanted to set the scene in Washington, which has been known for about 100 years as the city of trees, actually going back to about the time that Theodore Roosevelt was president, and also talk a little bit about my, my connection with all of this. So this is what we're most famous for, our cherry trees. They were a gift from Japan in 1912, so that was after he was president. This is Polly Alexander, uh, my friend who is a botanist and an artist. She and I went to the University of Vermont together, and after we graduated, I was living in Washington with my husband when he started law school, and I was looking for a job. I had been the news director for a radio station in New Hampshire. Can you guys, am I, is it okay? If, should I come out here? Okay. Um, I had been the news director for a radio station in New Hampshire, and I came to Washington with my husband thinking, you know, I'd be the next Connie Chung. And some of you remember who Connie Chung was, is. Um, and that didn't really work out, but what happened instead is I fell in love with the trees in Washington. And, you know, we're famous for our cherry trees, but we have over 300 species of trees in Washington. And they're very baffling to identify. So I got the idea to do this book. I lured my friend Polly down from Vermont, and the two of us spent two years working on the first edition of City of Trees. The cherry trees really are incredibly lovely in every light, in the rain. Um, this is the Capitol grounds, and the Capitol grounds are actually officially an arboretum. Um, the, the Morton Arboretum <coughs> ranks arboretums and certifies them. And this is a class two arboretum. You have to have at least 100 species of woody plants 
Um, to, be, to qualify as a, as a level two arboretum, you have to have a documented collection program, you have to have an education program. The grounds are beautiful. I'm sure a lot of you have visited the Capitol. If you go back again, make sure you walk around and look at the trees. There are uh, state trees from, from all across the country. There are, a lot of them are memorial plantings that were planted by members of Congress and, and various groups. The grounds were um, landscaped by Frederick Law Olmsted, who also designed Central Park. And there are a lot of similarities between the Capitol grounds and Central Park. I lead tours at the Capitol grounds several times a year. I'll be doing two in November, one for the U.S. Botanic Garden, which is right at the base of the Capitol, and another one for the Nature Conservancy. These are the three editions of my book. Uh, the one on the left, let's see if this pointer works. This one came out in 1981, and then uh, this, is, this was the first uh, paperback field guide that was published by Johns Hopkins in the 80s. And this is the most recent one published by the University of Virginia Press, which, which we have here today. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the tree diversity in, in the Washington area. Um, we are on the, the I, I don't know if you know about the different um, regions, the coastal plain and the Piedmont, but in Maryland and Virginia, you've got the flat coastal plain that goes over to the ocean, and then you have this hilly region called the Piedmont, which leads up to the mountains to the west. And they, they each have their own flora. You know, they have, they have plants that are native to each of these regions. There's a lot of crossover, but there are some that are unique to each region. And, and Washington, being right on the fall zone, has all this overlap between coastal plain and, and Piedmont plants. We're also kind of on the line between the north and south. So we've got sugar maples from the north. We have uh, bald cypresses from southern swamps that can grow um, in, in uh, swamps near Washington. And then we have this international tree population. Can you guys read, can you see the, um, the letters up there at all? I'm wondering if we could dim the lights a little bit. Would that be possible? Do you know? I'm looking at you, Clay. Uh, we'll try, but be careful about the video. Oh, okay. So, I'm just wondering. Just there we go. Okay, that's good. Is that, can you see it now? Better. Okay, well, it's okay. I will, I will read the, the text, so you don't need to see it. But we have this international um, tree population because it's been a tradition in Washington for many years that people bring their favorite trees from wherever they, they come from in the world. And we have this remarkable climate that can support all kinds of trees. For instance, we have giant sequoias on the Capitol grounds, and you wouldn't think they could survive in the humidity. The original city plan of Washington, um, George Washington chose the site for the city. And then he worked with Pierre L'Enfant, who is a European-born designer, to design the city. And they incorporated all kinds of green space and, and trees. So this is a typical tree-lined avenue in, in Washington. Now, when I worked on the research for the book, it wasn't only the, the, you know, the botanical diversity that was fascinating. It was the history. And I found out that... Theodore Roosevelt is not our only president to have been a very accomplished naturalist. He was in really good company with George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. If any of you have been to Monticello, which is Jefferson's home, or Mount Vernon, which is Washington's home, you know what incredible gardeners, horticulturists, and, and farmers they were. When Jefferson was president in the, at the turn of the 19th century, he was so upset to see that trees had been cut down. I'm, I'm going to read a quote from him just to let you know how upset he was. <laughs> I told you I was tech challenged. I can't even set this on a table. Here we go. Um, <laughs> so he's quoted as saying, I wish I was a despot that I might save the noble, the beautiful trees that are daily falling sacrifices to the cupidity of their owners or the necessity of the poor. The unnecessary felling of a tree, perhaps the growth of centuries, seems to me a crime little short of murder. It pains me to an unspeakable degree. But he didn't just talk about how painful it was. He actually designed and executed the first street tree planting uh, on record in Washington. 
This is Pennsylvania Avenue. That's the original dome of the Capitol. And he lined it with Lombardi poplars. So that's the first <laughs> street tree planting on record. And then George Washington, oops, upside down. Um, this is George Washington's Mount Vernon. Uh, Washington was a serious tree lover. And there are now four trees at Mount Vernon that, that he planted that are still alive today. And this is one of them. This is a tulip poplar or tulip tree planted by Washington in 1785. It's an incredible tree. I find it so remarkable that we have this living link to George Washington. I was down there in the spring getting ready to give a talk for Smithsonian Associates, and I met this wonderful family. They were, they were from the West Coast. And they were walking by, and I just thought, you know, they, they need to know this tree was planted by George Washington. I just had a feeling they'd really appreciate it. And they did. They went right over to the tree. The kids were hugging the tree. And, you know, they're from the West Coast, and I think this was the largest tree in the East Coast that they had seen on their travels. And then um, many presidents have planted trees at the White House. These are the Andrew Jackson magnolias. Okay, so getting to Theodore Roosevelt, has anyone heard about the tennis cabinet? This is the tennis cabinet, and the tennis cabinet, um, these were staff members at the White House, colleagues of Roosevelt, and they started out playing tennis, but they got into a whole lot more rigorous things, um, including the very ambitious point-to-point -point hikes in Rock Creek Park that, that Roosevelt loved leading while he was president. This was their farewell photograph, and I don't know if you can see in the front, there's a, there's a cougar. It's a, it's a bronze sculpture of a crouching cougar that they gave to him as a gift, as a farewell gift. And um, his, uh, Roosevelt's explorations of Rock Creek Park, I think the most famous ones are these ambitious hikes that were really grueling. And, you know, a lot of people could barely keep up with him. Hardly anyone could keep up with him. He would just sort of choose a route, and then they, you know, they didn't follow a path, they would just go over whatever they came to, and, um, you know, through the creeks, um, as Char was talking about this morning, uh, they'd take off their clothes and, and just keep going through the water, so they were very ambitious. But I wanted to open with this quote, um, this is, a, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, he, uh, Roosevelt wrote, when our children were little, we were for several winters in Washington, and each Sunday afternoon, the whole family spent in Rock Creek Park, which was then very real country indeed. Okay. Do you see this guy here? <laughs> see who that is going right up that rock cliff? So this was one of um, what the president called his scrambles. And um, this, this photograph is... Oh, this is in the Library of Congress. I, I didn't get this from the, from the archives. Oh, yes, I did. I did. It's a Library of Congress photograph. It is in the um, Theodore Roosevelt Center archives. And um, it's, the description is, President Roosevelt and some unsuspecting friends go for a little walk in Rock Creek Park. Roosevelt enjoyed rock climbing and referred to it as scrambling. Um, so, I have tried to find that very spot, and I haven't quite pinpointed the exact spot, which is very frustrating, but I'm quite certain it is, it is this rock outcrop called Pulpit Rock, and you can see here, um, this is Rock Creek, and this, this, com this, this rock um, cliff comes right up from the water. It, there's so, there are so many trees and shrubs that have grown up that it's even hard to tell in winter exactly where the spot is. Um, this is the top of the uh, top of Pulpit Rock, and here's a little sign for it. And he, this was one of his favorite places uh, to bring people for rock scrambles. And there you can see um, this is a you know a more jagged part of the top of the cliff. Uh, this uh, forgive this, <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt's Mar-a-Lago. That's not me, but I led a walk um, in the spring for the. Um, these are uh, the, um, it's, it's a group called the DC Eco Women. They're a group of women who are environmentalists and a lot of them work at the EPA and other agencies or for nonprofits or law firms that focus on environmental law. And they do a lot of, you know, a lot of fun things. 
And you can see here, they're hiking up the Theodore Roosevelt Trail. This is one of my favorite trails in Rock Creek Park. It, um, it's, it's not a very long trail. I think it's only about a quarter of a mile. Um, but it goes right up to Pulpit Rock. And I have a map here I can show you afterwards. This is a map of the trail system in Rock Creek Park if anyone is interested in seeing exactly where this trail is. After I led the walk, um, uh, one of the members of the group wrote this blog about it. She, she wrote a really nice blog. I, I have it on my website. And it's really, it, it's a perfect trail to be named for Roosevelt because it's a very twisty trail. It's got lots of roots growing over it and rocks and, you know, you could imagine that you're up in the Adirondacks. Um, so I, I'm just so tickled that this trail is named for him. This is a uh, beech tree. The trees in Rock Creek Park are really amazing because the park, I'm going to talk a little bit about how it was created in 1890, the same time as Yosemite. So these trees have been left alone for a really long time and they're very big. This is wild sarsaparilla growing at the base of this beautiful beech tree and these are New York ferns, which is quite appropriate. So, this morning, um, Char Miller talked about Juicerand, Ambassador Juicerand, going out with, with Roosevelt. And this is a picture of the ambassador. He was, a, he was the ambassador from France for a very long time, all during, I think all during Roosevelt's administration, maybe not the whole thing, but, but through the last years at least. And there is actually this odd memorial to him that's in Rock Creek Park. It's quite close to the Theodore Roosevelt Trail and Pulpit Rock. And it's, it's a bench. I had my husband take this picture of me sitting there so you could see the scale of it. It's kind of an, it's in an odd place. You, there's no trail to it, so you have to kind of cross a road to get to it or bushwhack down from a parking lot. But there it is. And Char talked about the, oh geez, the batteries came out. <laughs> this is some kind of voodoo. Okay. Could, let's see, I think I've got it. I've got to aim it at the right place. Well, no. Oh, yes, okay. It's working. It's, never mind, it's working. Um, but I wanted to read this description now. Um, he talked about how um, the, the um, incident with the lavender kid gloves, do you remember that moment from this morning? That it was in the Potomac River. And I've, it probably was the Potomac River, but a lot of accounts place it in Rock Creek Park. Rock Creek flows into the Potomac River, and Roosevelt explored all, you know, he explored the creek and the river. So sometimes it's hard to tell exactly where things happened. But I want to read this quote from um, this William Roscoe Thayer. Is this a good biography? Early Is it? Biography. Pardon me? It's a good early biography. Or early, yeah, it's 1919. So it was published the uh, year that he died. And I gather, Clay, that he was a friend of Roosevelt's. Yeah, very Roosevelt. Yeah, yeah. So um, here's what he wrote. And, and this is just very colorful, so I have to read it. Um, in Washington, the president continued his practice of hiking, but in a somewhat modified form. His favorite resort was Rock Creek, then a wild stream with a good deal of water in it, and here and there steep rocky banks. To be invited by the president to go on one of those hikes was regarded as a mark of special favor. He indulged in them to test a man's bodily vigor and endurance, and there were many amusing incidents and perhaps more amusing stories about them. What must have been the surprise in the French Foreign Office when it received the following dispatch? Okay, so this is the disclaimer. He says in parentheses, I give the substance, of course, because I have not seen the original. So this isn't the original dispatch. This is his reporting on it. Yesterday, wrote Ambassador Jusseron, President Roosevelt invited me to take a promenade with him this afternoon at 3. I arrived at the White House punctually, in afternoon dress and silk hat, as if we were to stroll in the Tuileries garden or in the Champs-Élysées. To my surprise, the president soon joined me in a tramping suit with knickerbockers and thick boots and soft felt hat much worn. 
two or three other gentlemen came, and we started off at what seemed to me a breakneck pace, which soon brought us out of the city. On reaching the country, the president went pell-mell over the fields, following neither road nor path, always on, on, straight ahead. I was much winded, but I would not give in nor ask him to slow up because I had the honor of La, La Belle France in my heart. At last we came to the bank of a stream, rather wide and too deep to be forded. I sighed relief because, because I thought that now we had reached our goal and would rest a moment and catch our breath before turning homeward. But judge of my horror when I saw the president unbutton his clothes and heard him say, we had better strip so as not to wet our things in the creek. Then I too, for the honor of France, removed my apparel, everything except my lavender kid gloves. The president cast an inquiring look at these as if they too must come off, but I quickly forestalled any remark by saying, with your permission, Mr. President, I will keep these on. Otherwise, it would be embarrassing if we should meet ladies. And so we jumped into the water and swam across. <laughs> and there is a letter in, um, in the archives from Gifford Pinchot to Roosevelt referring to the ambassador as the man who wore gloves while swimming. <laughs> so that's pretty colorful, to say the least. Okay, now I'm going to read part of this letter. This is a letter to Kermit. Um, it's dated January 21st, 1906. I'm actually going to read this whole letter. You guys probably can't see that, can you? Okay. Um, Dear Kermit, this is when Kermit was at Groton. I think he was 16 years old at the time. So this would have been three years before they went to Africa. Is that right, Darren? Yeah. Okay, so um, just bef because the end of this letter refers to something interesting, um, Kermit, Kermit went to Africa with, with his dad. And Darren writes about this quite extensively. Mrs. Roosevelt was very nervous about him going, and you talk about how Kermit was just so fearless. I mean, uh, I don't know if you want to add anything about how he, you know, when he was out hunting really dangerous large animals, um, his dad had, uh, had a few really nervous moments, to say the least. Okay. Dear Kermit, I'm very much pleased with your marks. I think you did well and are to be congratulated. I know you will try to keep up to this level. Yesterday, we took a scramble down Rock Creek. Uncle Douglas, Grant Lafarge, Bob Bacon, and the French ambassador going with me. We had a first-rate time, although the French ambassador found it a little too much for him. But he is a trump and did his best. Today is a mild, beautiful day, and Mother and I are going for a good long ride together. I hope the little gold bear pin got to you all right. I am very much interested in the books you were reading, and I have almost exactly your tastes about them. Would you care to read an interesting book called Flashlights in the Jungle? It is an account of hunting and of photographs of wild game and of natural history in East Africa. Is it the kind of book you have any interest in? Ever your loving father, T.R. P.S. Mother says you wouldn't care in the least for flashlights, so I shan't send it. <laughs> so one of the famous stories about Roosevelt in Rock Creek Park is that he lost a ring that has never been found. And it was near this bridge. Um, this, is, this is called Boulder Bridge. It was a brand new bridge at the time. It was built in 1902, and this, this happened in 1902. And um, so he lost the ring. And he placed an ad in the uh, Washington Star that said, this is, this, is the, this is the ad right here at the bottom, in, in the lost and found column in the Washington Star, dated July 14th, 1902. Lost by the president, an all gold seal ring on left bank of Rock Creek, 100 yards above Boulder Bridge, $25 for its recovery. So it's never been recovered, as far as I know. So um, this is my book, A Year in Rock Creek Park. It's a, um, my other nature books are, 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 are more factual and informative, and, and they're, they're field guides. 
But this is a, a very personal nature memoir, and I, I spent a year exploring Rock Creek Park, especially, as Pamela was saying, this uh, Boundary Bridge area of the park. And, and I talk about the seasonal changes, the trees, the wildlife, the birds, um, and, I, I, and I also have, it, it's mostly a very joyful uh, book of, of nature reveries, but I also have um, some strong concerns that I express through the book, including my concerns about climate change. And my year of record is the year 2007, and that was after Al Gore's film came out and people were just really waking up to the problem of climate change. And I was observing things in the park. Uh, we had a very weird warm winter and spring beauty plants bloomed on New Year's Day that year. We had daffodils blooming at, at Christmas time in Washington before the new year. And um, it was just a time of, you know, real concern. So these are, we have um, this, these are the two editions of the book. This, um, this, sorry, I need to go back. This is the version that we have. This was a, a deluxe edition that's, um, they only printed 350 of it. Um, and the, the woman who did the photography for this book is Susan Austin Roth on the left. And she's an amazing photographer, and on these photographs I'm going to show you now are all, of, all hers that she did for the book. Many of them are in, are in the books. Um, and she's, you know, she's written uh, ten gardening books that were illustrated with her photos. She's had her photos on the cover of Better Homes and Gardens. But this was her first real wild project. And she and I met in Fern Valley at the National Arboretum. And then the photographer who took this picture, Judy Leisht, um, I met her in Rock Creek Park. And I, I bring that up because there's a side to Washington that most people don't know about. And that is, we are very nature-oriented. We are a real outdoor city. You know, people are out on their bicycles. They're hiking in Rock Creek Park. They're paddling on the river. I went down to uh, the Key Bridge Boathouse in Georgetown on Labor Day, and there were 100 people waiting in line for kayaks and paddle boards. It's a real outdoor city. People have a lot of, um, you know, conversations in the woods, very much like in Theodore Roosevelt's day. And, and some of our, our uh, politicians and leaders are, are very nature-oriented. When Hank Paulson became the Treasury Secretary in the George Bush administration, I was asked to lead a hike for him and his wife Wendy and 60 members of the Treasury Department staff, a, a hike on a, a mountain right near Washington. Um, and, then I, and, and then Wendy and I led a, a walk for Laura Bush in the Arboretum. It was like a three-hour nature walk. Laura is a, a birder and um, we were out with her for three hours looking at birds and plants and with her high school friends that she hikes in national parks with. On the inauguration this year, um, our new congressman chose not to go to the inauguration and he asked me to lead a hike in Rock Creek Park and we had 75 people out in the park taking a hike. So there's this, this tradition that was so important to Roosevelt of getting out in nature, connecting with nature, exercising in nature is, is very much alive and well in Washington. I know you don't ever hear about it, so I just wanted to, <laughs> to get that out there. Um, and the park is just lovely. Um, it's, it's a home for, you know, it, it, the park protects a really vulnerable stream valley that goes through suburban and urban areas. Incredible habitat for wildlife. I mean, sometimes I just feel like I'm out in the mountains of West Virginia when I'm in Rock Creek Park and the, you know, the great blue herons come in and they're fishing along the banks and I see wood ducks and kingfishers and I hear the frogs and toads in the spring. It's really, really delightful. I know it's hard to believe that all this is going on in the middle of a city, but it really is. And then there are miles of wonderful hiking trails. People are running in the park, cycling. We have our major road through the park is closed on weekends and holidays and, and the cyclists just take over. And then the children are, you know, it's just great to see them out playing in the creek. So um, Rock Creek Park, it's actually as old as Yosemite. It's as old as the National Park creation of Yosemite in 1890. 
Rock Creek Park was created on September 27th in 1890 and, and this, by an act of Congress, and then by another act of Congress, Yosemite was declared a national park on October 1st of 1890. And it's one of the largest um, urban parks in the country. It is the oldest of, of the urban parks. It's twice the size of Central Park in New York City. And it's historically a favorite haunt of American presidents, most famously Theodore Roosevelt. And over two million people visit it a year. And then the part of the park, the National Park, which is within uh, the, the district line, it's all within DC, is, is a small part of the, all the parkland. The, the creek itself is 22 miles, I mean, I'm sorry, it's 33 miles long, and 22 miles of it are in Maryland. And fortunately, Montgomery County, Maryland had the wisdom to create a stream valley park along much of the course of the creek. So it does have quite a lot of protection. It's a pretty large watershed. I think it's about 75 square miles. And of course, it's part of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. These are some of the sites in the park. This is Pierce Mill. This is a grist mill that has been restored. And they, they actually have, they have a miller on staff. They have a miller named Miner, Gene Miner. I think that's funny, there's a miller named Miner. Um, and then on demonstration days, you can go and see corn being um, ground into cornmeal. One of the reasons George Washington chose this site for the Capitol is that there were a lot of swift flowing streams that could power grist mills and, um, and a lot of spring water. This is the nature center in the middle. And then these are, um, this is the Western Ridge Trail, and this is the Valley Trail. These are both about five miles long. The Western Ridge Trail goes on the western side of the creek, the Valley Trail on the eastern side. And then there are a lot of interlocking trails. And then this, of course, is Pulpit Rock, favorite place to go rock scrambling. And this is Boundary Bridge. And as Pamela mentioned at the beginning, this is my favorite part of the park. I mean, it's partly because it's closest to me, and I always tell people, if you want to um, really get close to nature, find a place that's very close to where you live, and then visit it all the time, you know, in every kind of weather, every season, and really get to know it. And when you have that intimacy with a particular place, you, um, it, it's, it's just, the rewards are boundless. This is a little footbridge. It goes from Maryland into DC, so yes, you can enter the the nation's capital on this bridge. And it was an FDR New Deal project. Several of the footbridges in the, in the park were uh, Roosevelt New Deal projects. Here it is from the side. I, in my book, I actually compare it to the, to the Japanese style bridge in Monet's garden. I know that's a bit of a stretch. <laughs> it's beautiful in the winter time. Which brings me to Theodore Roosevelt. What I'm doing now is I'm just kind of taking you through the seasons with Susan's beautiful pictures. And I'm going to intersperse with letters, uh, Roosevelt letters, about his, um, his adventures in the park. They're not chronological by year, but they are chronological by season. So this is another one to Kermit. It's dated February 19, 1903. Dear Kermit, the blizzard came along and we had enough snow to completely cover the roads. And then so much cold weather that it is not melted. In consequence, yesterday and the day before, I had two first-class horseback rides, being able to start from the White House, as I could go at a good swinging trot along the snow-covered streets, instead of having a long, tiresome, gingerly walk or skate over the asphalt. Rock Creek Park was beautiful. It is really a wonderfully wild place of, a wonderfully wild piece of scenery. The steep hillsides were covered with snow, which lay in strips on the limbs of the trees. And the stream churned noisily between the ice-rimmed banks and among the ice-coated ice boulders." So yes, he was a nature writer. I'm so glad that Duane talked about that, because I, I find his, just his experience of nature, um, it's just another aspect of him as a naturalist. You know, he was a serious scientist and taxonomist. But he also had this, this, poetic, this poetic sensibility when it came to nature. This I found very touching. This is a telegram to Roosevelt from the Prince of Prussia, Prince of Prussia Henry or Heinrich of Prussia. And it is dated 
I don't see the date here, sorry. I know it's on here. This, this, is, this is from the Digital Library. And it's to President Roosevelt, White House, Washington, USA. Cannot help reminding you of our charming little excursion on horseback in Rock Creek Valley, Creek is spelled with a K, just a year ago today. Greetings, Henry of Prussia. It's very simple, so touching that a year later, on that very day, he wanted to acknowledge it. Um, so this, these are box elder trees along the creek. You can read the big letters, right? Yeah, okay, good. And you know, what's so wonderful is I spent, I spent my first two days, I, get, I guess I came on Tuesday, so I spent Wednesday and Thursday in the Theodore Roosevelt National Park, um, the first day in the South Unit and the second day in the North Unit. And I saw so many familiar plants, including these box elder trees. They grow all along the Little Missouri. So it's pretty neat that they grow along Rock Creek and also along the Little Missouri. Okay, okay, this is a good one. This is another one to Kermit. He wrote, he wrote to Alice and Ted as well, um, when, you know, when they were away. But the, the, it just sort of the luck of the draw, the ones that I chose were mostly to Kermit. This is the second paragraph of this letter. It's dated February 16, 1908. Yesterday afternoon, Fitz Lee and John, I'm not going to pronounce his name right, but someone here probably knows how to pronounce it. Michelaney? Michelaney, do you know, Clay? It's M-C-I-L-H-E-N-N-Y. Michelaney? McElhenney? And I took Colonel Cecil Lyon of Texas for a walk down Rock Creek. The ice had just broken, and the creek was a swollen flood, running like a mill race. We did the usual climbing stunts at the various rocks, and then swam the creek. And it was a good swim in our winter clothes and with hobnail boots and the icy current running really fast. Colonel Lyon balked at the swim, or rather, he would have swum all right, but I was afraid to let him when I found he was doubtful as to his ability to get over, for I did not want a guest to drown on one of my walks. <laughs> okay, so this one is to um, a Dr. Rainsford, who I think was a clergyman that he knew in New York. It's dated February 18th, 1904. Is there any chance of your being in Washington at any time within the next few weeks? I should particularly like to see you. If you can come down, will you let me know in advance so that I may arrange to have you at lunch or dinner? However, if you will bring some rough clothes, and if you are willing to take a walk with a president who, like Mr. Tracy Tupman, has become both old and fat, I should like to take you down Rock Creek where if you go on the footpath and not on the carriage road, the scenery is really beautiful. Sincerely yours. So yes, the scenery is really beautiful. This is a um, belted kingfisher, um, which I, I actually dedicated my uh, Rock Creek Park book to the kingfishers and, and tulip trees of Rock Creek. When I went down to the little Missouri on Wednesday, at the, is it the Peaceful Valley Ranch? Is that what it's called? I walked down to the Little Missouri from there. I saw a kingfisher flying, flying right up the creek. It was so cool. Um, and this is a sycamore. Um, they don't grow this far west. Um, there, there are some out in California and Arizona, but this is the American sycamore of the east. And it's just lovely in the wintertime because of that white, white inner bark. And the tulip trees or tulip poplars are incredibly lovely in the winter. They, they don't get this far west either. I showed you the one that George Washington planted earlier on. And in the winter, the, um, these winged seeds, they're called samaras, and it's just a, a single-seeded winged fruit, and they, they grow in this cup-like uh, configuration. And when the afternoon sun shines on them, they just light up like, like candelabra. And then sometimes when it snows, They'll fill up with snow, and then they look like ice cream cones with vanilla ice cream. Another beautiful tree in the winter, this is, this is like an iconic site in Rock Creek Park, are these American beech trees. They have uh, very smooth gray bark, and then they have marcescent leaves. Does anyone know the name, the term marcescent? It just means um, 
that something that holds on to a plant after it's already fulfilled its vital role. And these get bleached out. They're like a real pretty wheat color. So when you, when you go, even if you're just driving through the park, you'll see the smooth gray trunks of the beech trees with the marcescent leaves. It's an iconic sight. And then when spring comes, the wildflowers are amazing. And the new leaves, every spring I think of Robert Frost's poem. Does anyone know the, the poem, Nothing Gold Can Stay? The first line of it is, nature's first green is gold, her hardest hue to hold. And you know how when the new leaves come out, they have that tender, that tender gold color here. Um, you can see it a little bit. And then, and then suddenly one day you'll notice that they're all green. It's all, everything's a uniform green. This is the bloodroot. This is a very early wildflower. I don't know if you have it here in North Dakota. Um, Roosevelt loved this flower. I have a quote from him about it at the end of the talk. Spring beauties. Virginia bluebells. These carpet are um, streams and rivers in our area. And then this is the pinkster or wild azalea. And this is another rock outcrop um, that is near Boundary Bridge. I lead a lot of nature walks in the park for a lot of different organizations. And we often have picnics on, this, on top of this rock under this wild azalea. And this was one of my favorite things to find in the archives. I hope I can read it. Okay, this is another letter to Kermit, <laughs> May 15th, 1907. At last, spring seems to have really begun. The last two days have not been hot, but they have been warm, the warmest weather we have had since March. Mother and I, with Ethel and Senator Lodge, had a beautiful ride yesterday. The azalea, and then he says in parens, I always rather like its old New York Dutch name of Pinkster is in bloom, and the woods are beautiful, while the bridal trails through them along Rock Creek really are, are very, really add very greatly to the pleasure of riding. Fifteen years ago, there were no wire fences around Washington. The country was not built up, and Lodge and I used to go everywhere, jumping an occasional fence, but this is no longer, but this no longer can be done, and the bridal trails in Rock Creek Park are really the best substitute. And I haven't mentioned yet that, um, that there are two riding stables in the park, and some of the trails are designated as horseback riding trails, so people still ride. I'm not going to read this, but this is interesting because it's about how some people are trying to talk him into running for a third term. So it's, an, it's another letter from the archives. So here are the tulip tree um, leaves in the spring. And one of the things that I find so charming in the spring is to watch the way the leaves pop out of the buds. Every year I lead bud break walks for the Audubon Naturalist Society. This year I led, it on, I led the walk on Theodore Roosevelt Island. When the tulip tree leaves come out of their buds, they, they reach for the sky. And I compare them in my book to babies' hands reaching for the sky. Um, and then you can see here, this is a, a, a flower of the tulip tree. It's, this tree is actually in the magnolia family. And so the flower, you can, I think, you can, the leaf doesn't look like a magnolia leaf at all, but the flower really does. And then the American beech has this beautiful pointed kind of mahogany co colored thin bud. And then you can see here the leaves are just starting to come out and they're covered with these silky white hairs. And then when they come out of the bud, they hang down toward the earth. And I, in my book, I compare them to dancer's skirts because they're so graceful. Eventually, the beech leaves and the tulip tree leaves all end up on a horizontal plane, but it's just so, so cool the way one reaches for the sky at first, and, and one reaches for the earth. And then these are all young oak leaves. And that nature's first green is gold, um, Robert Frost quote. You can see how these leaves are gold and they even red. Before the chlorophyll is really dominant, um, you know, which gives the leaves a green color, these other pigments can shine. And it's, it's what happens in the fall, but it also happens in the spring before the chlorophyll. 
The summer in the park is really delightful. Because these trees have been left alone since 1890, they form an incredible canopy. And I led a walk in June a couple years ago for Audubon, and we were out on a sunny beach along the creek, our group, and then we walked back into the woods, and we felt like we were walking into an air-conditioned room. It was that, the cooling was that dramatic. Okay, so this is a letter that shows, you know, we, we think of Roosevelt as a conservationist on the national scene. One of the things I find so touching about his relationship with Rock Creek Park is how he cares about things that are highly local. So um, this is a picture of um, a, a purple beech, which is a, a type of, it's a cultivar of the European beech, and this is Pierce Mill. This letter is to Colonel Biddle, who is um, a district commissioner who obviously has oversight over Rock Creek Park. My dear, it's dated June 19th, 1903. My dear Colonel Biddle, a month ago, Mrs. Roosevelt spoke to you about preserving that beautiful purple beach in the Pierce's Mill Meadow in Rock Creek. Not one thing has been done towards its preservation. The bank has eaten away under it so that a severe flood might at any time destroy it, and we should lose one of the most beautiful trees in the park. I think that steps should be taken without a day's delay to build some flood wall or something of the kind which would ensure the tree's preservation. Please let me know what can be done and when it can be done. Yours faithfully, Theodore Roosevelt. So that was the wall that Roosevelt wanted to build when he was president. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, so one of the things I love about leading nature walks in the summer in the park is all these little fruits are developing. You know, we, when, we, when I say fruit, you know, we usually think of fruit as being fleshy like an apple or a pear, but these are all dry fruits of trees and large shrubs. And they turn um, different colors in the fall, but in the summer they're all green. So if you just look into the canopy, everything looks green and you feel like you're just looking at leaves. When you start to look closely, you'll see that there's a lot happening and all these fruits are forming. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is July 30th, 1904. And this is to, it's addressed to Darling Bai. Um, Roosevelt's sister Anna was called Bamie. Am I pronouncing that right? When she was young, she was called Bamie. And then later she was called Bai because apparently she was a whirlwind of energy like her brother. And so you would see her coming by, and you know, then it was like, bye, because <laughs> she was moving so fast. Okay. We have appointed Admiral Converse. I, I don't know anything about him, but this is just a, a good yarn. On the whole, it seemed best if we passed by Evans not to go below an Admiral grade. Um, Morton is taking hold well, so I don't know anything about that. Okay, but this, this is pretty, pretty good. By the way, I took him and Metcalf for a scramble down Rock Creek yesterday. They both thought they were good walkers, forgetting that when a man is in the late 40s, he finds the term a good walker very different from what it was in the early 20s. <laughs> they were distinctly limp long before the end. I wish you could have seen Moody's delight um, over what is termed the initiation of the two new members of the cabinet. <laughs> okay. So um, here, um, this is autumn in Rock Creek Park, and um, we have a beautiful fall in, in, Ro in Washington. I'm from Vermont, and Vermonters think that fall color only happens in Vermont, and it is beautiful. We have sugar maples, which are so vibrant, a lot of dark green conifers and white birches, and it, it, it is really beautiful. But it only lasts for about a week. And in Washington, we have fall color from September through October and November, and even into December. And we have really beautiful fall weather. And I want to say, I have just been so charmed being here in the Badlands to see all of the golden trees there. I mean, they're really at their peak. 
especially up in the north unit. And, and you have here the gold of the, of the trees and then the gold of all the Aster family members that are blooming, and it is just stunning against the rock formations. So I just wanted to say that. Um, this is a sassafras tree. These are acorns and more acorns. I have so much fun leading walks in the fall. I mean, whether they're walks for children or adults, it doesn't matter. Everybody loves acorns. And these are witch hazels. Our native witch hazel in the east blooms in the fall. And one of my favorite things in the fall is to sit. I, I have a rock that I call the meditation rock. I, I write about it a lot in the book. It's just this rock in the creek. I had a picture of it before. I forgot to point it out. Um, and the, the uh, creek, uh, it's, it's a very, the stream valley is very steep there. So the trees are hundreds of feet above the creek. And when the wind blows and the leaves start to fall and they're all dancing down, every leaf has its own dance. They land in the creek, and then there's like a moment of grace when they, they just land, and then they start to float down the creek. And I could just sit for hours and watch that, and I would never consider that wasted time. Okay, poor Colonel Biddle. This is another letter to Colonel Biddle. Um, he was the one that Roosevelt wrote to about the Purple Beach. You have charge of Rock Creek Park, have you not? If so, if so, I wish to lay before you certain facts. The other day, to my surprise, and I might almost add to my horror, I found that preparations were being made for flagging one or more of the footpaths through the park. That is, for changing them from woodland footpaths into stone sidewalks. Now, I think this is a real and serious mistake, and I wish most emphatically to protest against it. When people go into the park to walk, they go to get off the pavements. And it is more than absurd, carefully and at much expense, to see that they are unable to get off. I had noticed for some time these messes of big stone flags at certain points in the stream bottom. But frankly, it never occurred to me that there could be any intention of using them for so foolish a purpose. But this other evening, but the other evening, in walking down, I was astounded to find that some flags had already been laid where the path on the west side of the stream crosses the meadow, a little above the northern boundary of the zoological park. The National Zoo is right on the edge of Rock Creek Park. Such a flag path is hideous to look at and will greatly detract from the beauty of the park, and it is uncomfortable to walk on. It is not a single merit. If anyone wants to walk on a pavement, let him keep in the city and not go off into the woods. Personally, I would far rather see a good dirt road in, in a park than the macadamized roads, but I do not make a point of this. When, however, the question is of doing all that can be done to ruin the park for the only people who care to walk in it by laying down these flag pads, I feel that, that the situation at least calls for an explanation. Sincerely yours. Poor Colonel Biddle. <laughs> but, I mean, that really shows, you know, how much he cared about this woodland in the middle of the city and did not want it ruined with a lot of pavement. And these would have been um, some of the small trees that he would have seen. These are the bridges of Rock Creek Park. And now I'm going to switch gears and very briefly talk about Theodore Roosevelt Island. I'm so glad so many of you have visited so, um, can you see this map well enough to get the main idea? Okay, so the White House is over here. So this is the White House. This island is about a, a mile and a half due west of the White House. And it's right off the, this is the Georgetown waterfront. The Kennedy Center is here. The Lincoln Memorial. Um, this is um, the Theodore Roosevelt Bridge, the Roosevelt Bridge, and this is the Memorial Bridge. Actually, I'm sorry, the, the Lincoln Memorial is down here. Um, so this is a 90-acre island, and um, this is the Potomac River coming down. Rock Creek flows in right in here. Um, this is called the Georgetown Channel on the eastern side, and Little River, which I find very poetic on the western side. This is Virginia, and this is a little part of the island. It's called Little Island. There's actually an inlet in between here. Um, the island is very wild. It was um, 
landscape by Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. in the 30s. Um, the uh, a CCC um, Conservation Corps planted a lot of native trees. I'm not going to get into a lot of history, but it has a fascinating history. It's now administered by the National Park Service. Um, and the way you get to it is from this little footbridge here from Virginia. The whole island is in Washington and within the D.C. borders. And it's right at the fall zone. So it's the last navigable point on the river. And the river is tidal up to that point. And one of the fun things about exploring it is that there's a very dramatic change in the tide. So when you go there at low tide, you've got a lot of mud flats around and you'll have egrets and herons um, wading and um, foraging. Um, and then when it's high tide, you can, I do a lot of paddling around the island. You can get right up to the island shoreline. So it's, it's just really fun to see the changes. This is, um, this is a kayak coming around. When you come, this is a little island here. And when you come around the bend, you've got this dramatic view of the Lincoln Memorial. Um, this is, believe it or not, a cottonwood tree. And we have the same exact species of cottonwood in Washington at Theodore Roosevelt Island, and there are a few in Rock Creek Park that you have here. So I, I just think that's way cool. Here's a, here's a turtle basking. You see lots of turtles basking when you paddle around the island. These are Civil War soldiers on the island. This is, there are a lot of things in the, in the archives, in the di digital archives, about Theodore Roosevelt Island. So if you're interested, you can find a lot of material online. This is one of my favorite trails in, in, the, in the park. It's a, a boardwalk that goes along a tidal inlet and then into a swamp. It's called the Swamp Trail. And this is wild rice, native wild rice. Um, this tree here is a sycamore. I showed you a sycamore in the winter. This is a sycamore in the summer. I call this particular tree grandmother. You can see it from so many different vantage points, from Virginia and from Key Bridge, which is on the other side, and from the water when you're paddling. Now, these are some descendants of Theodore Roosevelt. Um, some of you probably know Tweed Roosevelt in the black jacket, who um, is uh, the chairman of the board of the Theodore Roosevelt Association. He is Theodore Roosevelt's great-grandson. Archie was his grandfather. And then in the green coat is Susan Roosevelt Weld, um, who's descended from uh, Ted, who was her grandfather. So she's also Roosevelt's uh, great-granddaughter. And then this is Winthrop, um, Tweed's son. who So he's great-great-grandson of Roosevelt. And Winthrop is looking at the mudflat. We, we did a walk there this winter. and. The, the tide was low, and Winthrop spotted some beaver tracks in the mud flat. So that's what we're all looking at, are the beaver tracks. Leaning over next to Winthrop is um, Nikki Goldstein. She's on the board of the Friends of Theodore Roosevelt Island, which is this wonderful nonprofit that's partnering with the National Park Service to take care of the island. And this is a representative of uh, Congressman French Hill's office. Um, um, Hill is a huge fan of Roosevelt, and he's really interested in helping out um, there's, there are going to be improvements. I mean, it's going to be very slow going, but they are going to be making improvements at the island to have better uh, education facilities and um, education programs and other facilities. And then this is Rod Ross. He is the um, a natural resource manager for the city of Alexandria, and he's a really good botanist, and he, he came for a walk with me in the winter in the pouring rain um, to help me identify some of the plants for this project that I'm working on, this book project. This is um, the footbridge from Virginia. It's really kind of a lovely bridge. It's, to me, I'm not in love with it the way I'm in love with Boundary Bridge, but I really do love this bridge. And this is a little river here. There's the island. There's the Virginia shore. And you can, maybe you can just see the spires of Georgetown University there. Now, in the middle of the island is this larger-than-life um, sculpture of Roosevelt. It's about 17 feet tall, and it's surrounded by this, it's like a moat that goes around, and it's lined with uh, willow oaks. And then there are some um, stone tablets that have quotes, and the, this is the nature, nature tablet, and, and what it says on there, so uh, there are quotes from Roosevelt about nature. Uh, the first one is, there's delight in the hearty life of the open, 
And then, there are no words that can tell the hidden spirit of the wilderness that can reveal its mystery, its melancholy, and its charm. The nation behaves well if it treats the natural resources as assets which it must turn over to the next generation, increased and not impaired in value. And that has been a real theme of this symposium, is how much Roosevelt cared about uh, few, you know, the future generations. And I don't know what he would think of that statue. I, I'm friends with another one of Roosevelt's um, great-granddaughters, uh, Joanna Sturm, who's a birder. We, we go for birding walks together there. And she is the granddaughter of Alice. And she was at the dedication with Alice, who she said was mumbling about the statue through the whole, through the whole dedication. She was not a fan. I don't know how Roosevelt would feel about it. Um, but I think he would be really happy to see all the crew teams practicing on the river, because I know he was a rower. And when you go out and, and you get out on the river in the afternoon, which I love to do, you see all the high school and college crew teams out practicing. And then this, is, this was taken, I led a paddling trip around the island just last Saturday, so less than a week ago for the Friends of Theodore Roosevelt Island. And the evening before, I went out to kind of scout. I, before, when I'm leading field trips, I always go out ahead of time to sort of scout and see what's there, so I'll know what to point out to people. And this was kind of unusual, but this is Little River. It was just smooth as glass. It was just so lovely. And you know, you can be in the middle of the city and just have such a sense of peace. So I wanted to close, close with this quote. Um, this is from the autobiography. This is from the chapter, I think it's called um, Outdoors and Indoors, when he's talking about his love of nature and, and his love of literature and sort of the connections between the two of them. Now, he's writing about Sagamore Hill, and it's interesting how Duane um, also read a quote about Sagamore Hill and said he would picture it being about North Dakota. If you just take out the Sagamore Hill part, it's, it's very universal. So I kind of do this with this quote for, for Washington. Roosevelt wrote, We love all the seasons, the snows and bare woods of winter, the rush of growing things, and the blossom spray of spring the yellow grain, the ripening fruits and tassel corn, and the deep leafy shades that are heralded by the green dance of summer, and the sharp fall winds that tear the brilliant banners with which the trees greet the dying year. And then I want to thank you so much for inviting me here and just read this quote about the bloodroot. This again is um, talking about the bloodroot in Oyster Bay. Early in April, there is one hillside near us which glows like a tender flame with the white of the blood root. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. That was great. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And I'm so eager to hear more about the island. And when will that book yes. appear? So I'm just, my year of record uh, started in July of 2016, and uh, so finished in July of this year, so now I'm in the editing process and all of that, so hopefully within a year or two. So you probably know we were, we're working with Michael Cullinane on the project yes. that yes. You're, I think yes. you're in. Yes, uh, A film about uh, TR Island yes. and the 50th anniversary is coming yes. up just Oh, and I meant to mention that. Yes, it's on October. The 50th anniversary of the sculpture, I knew when I was looking at that slide there's something else I wanted to say, and I, I forgot what it was, but yeah, the sculpture will be 50 years old on a, in, in October. 29th, yeah. On the 29th, they're having a, um, a big celebration on the island. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah. So, we, you know, we are really out of time, and we'll have more yes. time tomorrow, but I wanted to say three things. Number one, maybe the only area where Jefferson and Roosevelt agreed was their love of trees. Yes. Uh, Roosevelt despised Jefferson in almost every mm -hmm. other way. Mm -hmm. You made four or five little hits about your politics. Just wanted to warn you, we're, in, we're in red state country oh, I here, know that. so I know uh, that. you may be lynched. <laughs> uh, and as to cottonwoods, I know you yes. said you love the cottonwoods that you saw. I want you to come back when you when they're at their best, because this is not the best year for cottonwoods because mm -hmm. of the drought, and yeah. you should see it when they are magnificent here. Yeah, well, they're pretty nice. A lot of them are gold. And oh, oh I wanted to also mention Dwayne um, read that beautiful quote. It was it was it was in a bird quote. Um, he was talking about, um, 
Oh, the shimmering, tremulous leaves of the cottonwood. And maybe if we see a cottonwood tomorrow, I can show you why they, why they do that. Oh, good, let's. Yeah, because of the way the stem is attached to the leaf. So we'll stop at a cottonwood yeah, grove, and then nice. you can talk about yeah, this. Yeah, I'd let's love see. to do that. Uh, any, any quick question? I think people are tired. But tomorrow yes. we will ask you yeah. many, many, many Thank questions. Thank you for hanging in there, you guys, for, for all of this. Thank you so much. <laughs> Melanie Chukas Bradley, thanks for wrapping up this day. Sharon, I know you have a couple of quick uh, comments.